Hey friends, look here, I'm outside in the Minnesota spring. There's actually sun shining, there's still snow on the ground, but it's got to be like warm enough to be out here without a coat. I'm kind of impressed. So I thought I'd just sit out here and get some sun and chat with you a little bit about some esoteric subjects, genetic assimilation and genetic accommodation. You won't mind if you hear a few birds chattering in the background, will you? Okay, so let's talk about some of these terms. So when a trait is environmentally induced and its obligate expression is at a low frequency in a population, that is, there is not a strong expression of this particular trait in all members of the population, selection can drive a constant constitutive expression to fixation. That is, a trait can start out as a variable phenotype controlled by the environment, but it can later be locked into a genotype. This is called genetic assimilation. Just to quote Conrad Waddington on this one, he said, a process by which a phenotypic character, which initially is produced only in response to some environmental influence, becomes, through a process of selection, taken over by the genotype. So it is found even in the absence of environmental influences which it had first been necessary. So there's also a complementary phenomenon where a variable responsiveness to environmental conditions can be selected for greater plasticity. That is, a trait that is constant in the population can become increasingly variable under different conditions. This is called genetic accommodation. I know, it sounds an awful lot like genetic assimilation. We'll make some examples here to clarify the difference. Uh, genetic accommodation refers to changes in the regulation of the expression of the trait. These phenomena are sometimes referred to as the Baldwin effect because he published a description of the processes in 1902 saying how the kinds of physiological adaptations that allow organiz organisms to survive in variable environments can be the raw material for selection. So we're not just looking at variation in allele frequency, we're also looking at variation in response to environmental stimuli. One way to think about it is that if selection operates on variation in a population, the capacity for a plastic response to the environment is another variable that can be affected. The sensationalist way to think about it that you sometimes see people saying is that these are cases where the environmentally induced phenotypes precedes the genotype. But we wouldn't want to do that, now would we? Uh, it's more of a relative shift. All phenotypes are the product of genes interacting with the environment. Uh, and these are phenomena where the relationship between gene and environment is more balanced and obvious, shifting to a situation where the genetic effect predominates in the case of assimilation. The key to understanding the difference between the two is that genetic assimilation reduces the sensitivity of a trait to environmental influences, while genetic accommodation tends to increase responsiveness to the environment. Okay, so you're all saying this is kind of esoteric and subtle and very theoretical. Fine. Do you have any examples of genetic assimilation and accommodation in the real world? And fortunately, I do. And it's one of my favorite experiments. So this is work by Suzuki and Neichout that was published in 2006. And it was an experiment that simultaneously demonstrated the existence of genetic assimilation and of e accommodation. Before I get into it, let me define a few words though. There are a couple of words I'm going to be using that have, has fen as a root. And these are very common sorts of words, but they may not be familiar to everyone. So let me expand your vocabulary a little bit. Okay, here's one most of you have probably already heard of, phenotype. Uh, a phenotype is the observable traits in an organism. And these traits are established by interactions between genes and the genotype and the environment. Another term, an appropriate term for this time of year, is phenology the study of cyclic events, especially related to the seasons. For instance, when flowers bloom in the spring, that's phenology. 
a seasonal change in morphology and physiology. And unfortunately, we're a little too early in the spring right now to see anything blooming, but it's coming soon enough. Okay, another term, monophenic, a trait that has a single pattern of expression that doesn't change with the seasons or the environment in any way. So it's a fixed trait in the population. Polyphenic is a trait that has variable or multiple patterns of expression in the population. So for example, a flower is sitting there as just a stalk all winter long or just a bulb, and then in the spring it changes its morphology and sprouts a flower. Okay, here's another fun word, phenocopy. Okay, a phenocopy is a form that is environmentally specified or environmentally modified, but it mimics a genetically de determined trait. So if you have some trait that is induced by a gene in one organism, you can try to induce a phenocopy by changing the environment of another organism. Okay, so we got some vocabulary now. Now we can start talking about this particular experiment. So here's the experimental animal, Manduca sexta. How many of you have met Manduca before? It's a beautiful, great big sausage-shaped caterpillar. It's very large, fills the hand nicely. It's kind of soft and squishy. I find them lovely organisms. Uh, if you are a tomato farmer, tomato gardener, or a tobacco farmer, you may not like them very much because they will gnaw down a plant pretty quickly. Uh, their common name is the tomato or to tobacco hornworm. And as you can see in this figure, they're this lovely, brilliant emerald green. So that's the better to blend into its environment. It's sitting there on a leaf, chewing it apart. Sorry, tomato plant. Uh, and by glowing a bright green, it matches the color of the leaf. And so it's defended by camouflage from predators, if it has any. Okay, Manduca sexta is always green. It's monophenic. Okay, it's got one form. It's always a green caterpillar. Eventually it's going to pupate and then it will eclose as a large moth, a sphinx moth, seen here. Now that's Manduca sexta. There is a related species called Manduca quinquamaculata, and that species is naturally polyphenic. What that means is that if you have larvae of quinquamaculata that hatch out in the early spring when it's cooler, like now. Uh, they develop into black caterpillars. The better to absorb the warmth of the sun. Although that's got a trade-off, of course, because now when you've got a black caterpillar sitting on your bright green leaf, it's going to be obvious to any predators or to any tomato gardeners who will go out there and pluck it out and squish it. Okay, however, if you have larvae that hatch out later in the spring or in the summer, in the heat of the summer, uh, what they do is they switch and those larvae develop bright green cuticles, just like Manduca sexta, so they blend in. They don't need as much uh, absorption of the sun to warm them up in the morning because it's already nice and warm. Okay, so here's the question we're going to ask. How difficult is it to evolve that, that polyphenic trait? Manduca quinquamaculata had to have done it once upon a time. Can we emulate the same thing in Manduca sexta? Can we trigger Manduca sexta to undergo a color, color change in its development dependent on the temperature? So one approach is to use environmental stressors to induce a phenocopy. That is, we're gonna give them a shock, a heat shock, to trigger changes in hormone expression and changes in the enzymes that make the cuticle black. So our approach is to use environmental stressors to create a phenocopy and then use selection to fix a more robust response into the genome. That is, Suzuki and Nijhout are going to observe genetic accommodation. The first step is we have to generate some visible variability in Manduca sexta. And that's tough because Manduca sexta is always this bright green. Not much you can do about it. Uh, so what they found, though, is that they 
discovered a mutant Manduka sexta that was always black. That somehow it was changed so that it never turned green, it was always black. So it's still monophenic, but it's black monophenic. What's cool about this particular mutant strain though, is it's also sensitive to heat stress. So what you do is you take this black larva and you expose it to heat shock. That is for about six hours, you bake it at uh, 42 degrees centigrade, which is about 108 degrees Fahrenheit for you Americans or non-scientists. And what that does is the heat suppresses an enzyme called dopa decarboxylase also called DDC. So DDC is the enzyme that, that synthesizes the black pigment melanin and by heating it up we block that synthesis so they turn green to varying degrees. So that's the cool trick we're going to perform is we're going to turn these mutant black manduka into green mandu manduka with a heat shock. Okay so here's a protocol uh, you take a bunch of black mutant manduka larvae and you heat shock them. So then you score the resultant larvae for color. If they remain black, they get a zero. If they switch totally to green, they get a four. So this little diagram illustri illustrates their color scale, scale that they're using. This response is variable. So the result is a batch of caterpillars with different degrees of green versus black after the heat shock. And then the researchers can select which variants to propagate into the next generation. So they start selecting. So first they're going to select the blackest of the caterpillars. So you give these caterpillars a heat shock, some of them stay black, and what you do then is pluck some of those out, and you set them aside for later breeding. This is going to be the monophenic line. That is the line that we are going to select for stronger resistance to heat shock so that they're always black no matter what you do. Okay, we're also going to select a subpopulation of the greenest caterpillars. This is called the polyphenic line. Uh, these are caterpillars that are black if you leave them alone, but that they become a bit more green if you stress them with heat shock. And as a control, we're gonna, you always have to have a control, you know this, right? Good scientists always have a control. So as a control, what they're gonna do is get another batch of caterpillar. They just randomly select without regard to their colors or their color change. Uh, this is the unselected line and they're gonna propagate those as well. So each of these subpopulations are allowed to grow up and to close into moths and are then bred together. Uh, the larvae are collected and given another heat shock. So in the next generation, we're going to collect the progeny of the polyphenic line, give them a heat shock, select the ones that turn green. We're going to take the progeny of the monophenic line, we're going to heat shock them, we're going to select for the ones that stay black as possible. And then we're also going to do exactly the same procedure to our uh, control line. Uh, and again, we don't care what color they turn, we just pluck out some random ones that we're going to breed into the next generation. Then we just keep going for multiple generations. Now, if there was no genetic foundation to these color patterns, then this experiment would fizzle out at this point. You would get no change in frequency over time. Uh, they would just be, keep going with the same proportion of black and green in every generation. Uh, this is not what they observed, obviously. They see a rapid and strong shift in the selected lines. So, with each generation, the monophenic line becomes more and more resistant to heat shock and stays black no matter whether you hit them hard with this temperature. And this happens fast, within eight generations of the start of the experiment. Uh, so by then, the monophenic line is locked into their black phenotype. This is called genetic assimilation. So you've just selected for resistance to a change in response to the environment. So they become less sensitive to the environment. The polyphenic line, on the other hand, keeps getting greener and greener and greener. Uh, that is, they become more sensitive to heat shock. Uh, they're black if they're kept cool, but they switch to green if they are stressed by exposure to fairly high temperatures. 
Now this is genetic accommodation because the lion has become more readily responsive to the environment. Again, look how quickly this happened. In less than 14 generations, they have a population that reacts strongly to heat shock with deactivation of that enzyme, dopa decarboxylase, so they don't produce the black pigment. The speed of these shifts tells us that these changes aren't the product of new mutations. The mutation rate isn't that high. What happened here is recombination. That incremental variations in alleles are present in the population and they're just reshuffled and recombined uh, to be fortuitously grouped together in single individuals, which makes them either more sensitive to the shock or less sensitive to the shock. Uh, this is working entirely with variant alleles that are already present in the population. We don't need mutation for this rapid rate of evolution to occur. Okay, what is the mechanism behind these effects? Let's look at a few diagrams. Here's a couple of things we know. Uh, DDC, dopa decarboxylase, remember, is the enzyme that produces the black pigment. So elevating DDC makes the larvae black. Reducing DDC makes the larva green. We also know another thing, that there is a hormone called juvenile hormone that suppresses dopa decarboxylase. If you block this hormone, the skin turns black. So what does this mean in terms of the mechanism of this change? Uh, what I'm going to show you here are some diagrams they're a little complicated to understand, but once you see them, you'll get them. So what you see here is on top, that's a normal wild-type Manduca sexta. And what's being plotted is the concentration of juvenile hormone in the larva. You can see those little bell-shaped curves over there to the right. Now, normally, this, this concentration of juvenile hormone is sensitive to temperature. That is, if you crank up the temperature a bit, the concentration of juvenile hormone shifts to the right. It becomes stronger in its effect. In wild-type Manduca sexta, that makes, this makes absolutely no difference. Because even in the unshocked state, the hormone is strong enough to suppress DDC. So as you can see in this diagram, the, um, the larva is green. It's going to stay green. Even if you shift it up a little farther to the right, it's still going to stay green. Stay green. Now, what they did, though, is that they made an enabling mutation. That is, they gave it this mutation that turns the larva black. And it turns out the way this works is it reduces the concentration of juvenile hormone. So in these embryos, juvenile hormone has shifted way over to the left. In this case, in the normal situation, no matter what you do, it's not going to get as high as the concentration in the wild-type larva. So it's always going to fail to suppress DDC, so you're always going to get black larvae. Now when you look at this diagram, you still got the same amount of play in the concentration of juvenile hormone. When you heat it up, yeah, you shift that concentration of JH to the right. So it's still doing exactly the same thing, but now it's in a smaller range. It's in a lower range of concentration. So it's not sufficient to suppress DDC. Now let's look at the response when we've selected for multiple generations for the polyphenic or monophenic phenotype. Okay, so now in this diagram, what you see on top is we're illustrating the effects of genetic accommodation. So in this example, what's happened is you've got the black mutation, which shifts all the curves to the left. So they're at a lower level. But what we've selected for is a stronger variation in response to heat shock. So when we do that, what happens is now we heat shock it and the curves, instead of following in the same range, they shift way, way over to the right. And that's sufficient to suppress DDC and produce the green phenotype. On the other hand, in the chart just below that, uh, we have an example of genetic assimilation. In this case, what's happened is we've taken that black mutant, which shifts everything over to the left, and we've selected 
for juvenile hormone concentrations that do not vary much under the effect of heat shock. So they shift over the left, they stay there on the left. So giving them a heat shock only causes the bell curve to nudge a little bit to the right, which is not sufficient to inactivate DDC. So these animals turn black, as you'd expect. Okay, so what does all this mean? What this means is that there are multiple mechanisms to induce changes in response to the environment. I would say, first of all, that every gene Every single gene in you, in Manduca sexta, whatever, is responsive to concentrations of stressors or, or other signals in the environment. It's just that some are pretty finely tuned and don't wobble very much, while others may vary wildly in response to the environment. So what we can do with genetic accommodation is basically select for the range of variation that these molecules make in response to environmental effects. We can make them more sensitive to the environment, which is what's going on with genetic accommodation. Or if we really want to keep that particular phenotype, we don't want it to vary as much, that it's got some selective advantage that is not going to tolerate variation, uh, you can select for factors that make it more robust, less flexible, and is more concentrated at one particular point in the phenotypic range, and that is called genetic assimilation. Wasn't that fun? So there are all these cool phenomena going on. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes people will say, well, this means phenotype comes before genotype, and okay, the visible phenotype does occur before the genotype, but it's really not a radical shift that phenotype is still dependent on the genome, still dependent on interactions with the environment, and so uh, you've still got this genetic component that can be selected for with classical evolutionary theory to produce a new phenotype. Okay, was that fun? Yeah, big green caterpillars, they're always fun. And I will stop it there and we'll talk to you later, maybe next week. Although I've also got something shorter I might do soon. But we'll see. Have fun. Thanks a lot for listening.